of all the figures in history, there's no one who's had so much thought put into them, uh, reflections, books written about them than Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, in our own day, there's all sorts of opinions about him, about whether he was great, whether he was terrible. Uh, there's, there's people who are absolutely devoted to him. There's people who are not his followers, but admire him. Uh, there's lots who have uh, opinions about him. And, and I guess uh, in the end, uh, lots of people will think he's great. Like he's a good teacher. He's wonderful, uh, said some good things, helpful. Uh, but it's really strange because in his day, that's just one of the things you couldn't come to the conclusion of. Either you thought he was much better than that, bigger than that, or you were uh, down on him and against him. And uh, of course, he existed. No one, uh, no one in the scriptures was seeing this guy and thinking, well, who is he? He's not isn't real. Uh, it's only kind of uh, very ultra postmodern thought that's ever doubted that Jesus ever existed. It's clear that he did from history. Um, but who was he? And even in his own day, he was a bit enigmatic. There were people who were asking questions and wondering who he was. I mean, we've seen... Uh, all the sorts of things that have been raised about him. Who is this that calms the storm? Who is this that claims to be the God who forgives sins? Could it be true? And Jesus understood that the crowds were divided and confused and some were excited. Uh, and so there was a moment in our next tough question is when he asks, who do people say I am? But even more, he's going to press the disciples and ask them to come to a conclusion. Let's pray. Let's get into God's word. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray as we see this tough question about Jesus' identity, we pray, please, that you'd help us to see clearly who Jesus is. Amen. We just come off last time looking at this kind of weird healing that Jesus did, the only one where he kind of half got it right, or so it seems, that it went in two stages, uh, where the blind man had uh, sort of been uh, partially able to see, but people look like trees walking around. And uh, then Jesus went again and he could see clearly. Well, it was kind of illustrative. It wasn't an accident. It's illustrative of what's happening with people and their unclarity, the blurriness with which they see Jesus. And that's going to come out in our passage today. So we're in Mark chapter 8 and we pick it up at verse 27, immediately after the blind man healing. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so you can see here is this moment where it appears that Peter has come to a conclusion that he can see clearly, but in fact his view is very blurred. He's got the right answer, but it's not the, he's misunderstood the whole concept. So it starts with Jesus asking, who do the people say I am? Now, if we did an opinion poll, you did a survey, we all hired Morgan Gallup to go out and, and, uh, and, and, and poll the people. What's the vibe? What's the word on the street? And all sorts of answers come back from the disciples. I mean, they can tell what the peoples are saying. They don't pick up on the negative ones in their reply because <coughs> uh, there are not actually that many of them. There's the, the Pharisees and, and so on who've said that He's uh, possibly a demon, the chief of demons, and that's why he's able to cast out demons. But that's not what the people are saying. What do the people say? Well, they're impressed. All the answers they give are impressive. Uh, the first one's a bit weird. Some say you're John the Baptist. That is uh, Jesus' cousin, uh, as we find out uh, elsewhere in Luke's Gospel. Jesus' cousin, who'd been beheaded by uh, King Herod, 
and King Herod had started this rumor after he killed Herod uh, and then heard about Jesus doing all these amazing, miraculous, wonderful things. He figured John had come back to haunt him, that he somehow his head had been reattached. And obviously, that when the king thinks that, as he's going a bit mad, uh, lots of other people are taking up, well, maybe that's true, if the king thinks that the king knows what he's talking about. And so rumors started to spread that maybe this is John the Baptist again, that it, maybe he'd escaped jail and he was back, or maybe he'd defeated death and he was back. Others were saying, well, no, no, you're, you're Elijah. Right? Elijah is a prophet from the Old Testament in one of the darkest periods of Israel's history when the nation had turned against God and all sorts of consequences were coming. And Elijah, uh, one of the mysterious things about him is that he never died. Uh, it's Elisha and another guy were there watching on as he was taken away up into heaven with a, a chariot of fire. And, and so, well, he went strangely. Maybe this is him back, right? This is the prophet from Elijah. Elijah was famous for doing miracles and strange things on, on the, using the word of God. I mean, he the famous ones, the confrontation with the prophets of Baal, where he called down fire from heaven and set an, uh, an altar and a sacrifice alight without matches, without any source of ignition other than God himself. And, and so things like that have happened in the past. I mean, there aren't actually that many times where there's a lot of miracles happening. There's the Exodus uh, with Moses and the plagues, the Red Sea and the, um, the amazing provision of God in the wilderness. There's the period of Elijah and then Elisha. Uh, where there's lots of amazing things being done by these two prophets. Uh, and then Jesus comes along and all of a sudden it's happening again. So it's a momentous occasion. And in people's minds, they're tying those things together. The third option though, is that people are saying, well, you're just another one of the prophets. You're the latest prophet. You're the newest prophet, perhaps. And, uh, and Jesus, and he knows that's what is being said about him. But he comes in with a much more difficult question. Difficult not because it's hard to answer, but difficult because it puts you on the spot. He says to Peter, who do you say I am? Who do you say? Oh, sorry. He says to the disciples, who do you say I am? Peter's the one that's going to suck it up and brave it and, and put up his hand and give an answer, which shows that Peter's by this point emerging as kind of the leader amongst the disciples he's the spokesperson for them and you'll see many times that going on in the gospel that peter is the speaker on behalf of the others and so peter puts up his hands he's he braves an answer and it's the first time anyone has come to this conclusion uh he says what about you who do you say i'm peter answered you are the messiah Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. That is, he doesn't say that Peter's wrong. He's just saying, keep it a secret. Right? I am the Messiah. He's, he's accepting what Peter's conclusion is. Now, what is the Messiah? We have all sorts of uh, terms in our modern day parlance about a Messiah complex and things like that. You know, just this great deliverer. But actually, the Messiah is more than that. In the Old Testament, the Messiah, the word means anointed one. It's uh, in from Hebrew. Uh, it's a, a Hebrew word in the Old Testament. Uh, you see it uh, in Psalm 2. Uh, it's where uh, God says, um, then why do the nations conspire and the people's plan in vain against me and against my anointed one? I've installed my anointed one, my Messiah, on Zion's holy hill. And uh, he's going to come and judge the nations and as so on as it goes on. Uh, and so the Messiah is the king. Uh, and so all the kings of Israel are actually called the Messiah because they were anointed. Uh, they were anointed by a prophet. That's how they received their kingship. Uh, Saul was anointed by uh, the prophet Samuel. David also was anointed by Samuel. And, uh, and so they are the anointed one, the appointed one, the appointed king. And what will the king, this Messiah, do uh, according to Old Testament prophecy? There's not just say so there's lots of messiahs, the, the kings, but there's going to be one coming in the future. The prophet Nathan says to King David, uh, your son is going to reign on your throne, David, forever. 
right? And he will judge in righteousness and so on. So there's this expectation in the Old Testament of not just a king, but an eternal king, one who will bring uh, bring his peace by you know, que- you know, quelling the enemies, defeating them, by destroying the enemies. In fact, you know, he will strike with the rod of his mouth and judge. But he will also bring salvation for God's people. And so there's wonderful hope in the Old Testament. And Peter is the first person to say, hang on, are you the Messiah? You're him, aren't you? You're the one we were told to by God to expect. And Jesus says, you're right, but keep it a secret. Why doesn't he want it known? Well, because uh, people are going to have wrong expectations. Maybe there'll be a revolution. Maybe they'll, they'll do something stupid. They don't understand what it is the Messiah has come to do. In their minds, they're thinking, Messiah, well, that's that's the guy who's just going to kick Roman butt, who's going to th- overthrow all our enemies. But that's not what he's come to do. And so as he warns them to be quiet and not tell anyone, he also begins to teach them for the first time what it is the Messiah has come to do. He began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers' law got to be killed and after three days now this is totally unlike anything they've expected right the king doesn't come to be rejected the king comes to seize power and to be admired and worshipped and followed and submitted to and so in Peter's mind he's got the right answer but he's seeing people walking around like trees it's all a bit blurry because he doesn't understand he hasn't put everything together from the Old Testament that actually there's someone is coming to do these things, be rejected and die and then rise. And so Peter just, he, his mind's blown and he can't help himself. He just blurts out, you're wrong, you're wrong. He rebuked Jesus, right? Which is a funny thing to do after you've concluded, you are the king of kings, the eternal king from God. I'm going to tell you what to do and that you're wrong. <laughs> right? You shouldn't do that. Uh, and so Jesus sternly rebukes him, doesn't he? He says, get behind me, Satan. What you're saying, Peter, is actually evil. You've come to the right conclusion, but you're speaking nonsense. It's wrong. It's coming out of your butt. Uh, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You're thinking in terms of human politics and human power and human armies and human kings, right? You're not thinking how God thinks. How does God think? Well, that he's sending the Messiah who will be king as promised, but he'll do it through winning people back to God through his death. He has to be rejected and killed. Now, he doesn't explain it here, but he's going to go on to explain it, that he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. We actually looked at that at church uh, last weekend uh, and how wonderful it is that the king offers his life as a ransom for many. So I won't go over that now. But he's going to be standing in our place. He's going to be taking the wrath of God for us. That's why the king needs to go and face the greatest enemies of all, of sin and death and the devil, and he will triumph there as he rises again. Peter doesn't understand any of that. And so it's possible to come to the right conclusions about Jesus, but it's still completely misunderstand as it turns out. And so the question I guess to us is, what about you? What about me? Who do we say? Who am I going to say? Who are you going to say? Jesus is, have you understood he's the Christ? Have you understood he is the one God promised? That everything about his life pointed to that fact, proved that fact. But have you also understood that you need him as your king? That he has died for you, he's done it to save you, and that you should become a follower of him He's going to call people to follow him. The next thing he says, in fact, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Just as I'm going to the cross and dying for you all, you must lay down your life for me and for the gospel. I am your king. I'm giving you a model. I'm giving you life. Come with me. If you understand who he is, then you would be foolish to resist him because he is the Messiah who is going to judge. He's also the saviour and life is found only in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray, please, that you'll help us to understand, accept and love the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, your king, the one you promised, the saviour, the one who has defeated not just human enemies, but the greatest enemies of our own sin, death itself. He has defeated that. 
he's defeated Satan, Satan is wounded and dying and going to his destruction because of what Jesus has done and who Jesus is. And so help us to see clearly, not like Peter who came to the right conclusion but misunderstood it, help us to really see clearly why it is that Jesus is the Messiah and why that's so great and what he's come to do for us. And as we go on in the last few tough questions, we pray that our lives will be found in him, that our answers will be your answers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Catch you next time for another devotion.